well, we only missed about two minutes of the lecture, so it should be fine. But it's pretty clear. And then you know, the code, code matrix is going to be D prime by N, where the, again, the large capital N refers to the number of instances we have. And then in the case of the code matrix, D prime refers to the dimension of each code vector. So far, so good. This was a problem. However, we talked about how we have to put some kind of constraints. Because if we don't put any constraints on W, N, or Z, if we don't put any kind of constraint, there are so many trivial solutions. Where the trivial solutions, one of which would be Z code matrix being identical to X the input matrix, and then W is going to be simply an identity matrix. And then in which case, this whole term, the Frobenius, squared Frobenius norm of the difference between the input observation matrix and the product of the weight and code matrices is going to be simply zero. And then that's precisely now what we want to do. And in the case of the principal component analysis, we talked about how the constraint is that the, these code vectors that we get or the code vector, the code random, a random variable code vector must be decorrelated. That is, their covariance matrix has to be diagonal. So there was one constraint that we considered for the principal component analysis. In the case of the non-negative matrix factorization, our constraint was relatively straightforward. That is, all the entries in W as well as Z. So the weight values, weight matrix and the Z matrix contain only non-negative values. And then how we talked about the non-negativity actually helps quite a lot. Now, today, we're going to learn another matrix factorization algorithm or the variance called k-means algorithm, or the k-means clustering to be start with. And in k-means clustering, we have a constraint And then this constraint says that the each and every code vector zi, let's not use i actually. In fact, I'm going to use zn. So the code vector z that corresponds, what is going on here? Code vector zn, that is the code vector of the xn, so the nth observation uh, vector, is a one hot vector. We briefly talked about what one hot vector is when we talked about the multi-class classification earlier in the lecture, where the one hot vector corresponds to a vector that contains only zero, is it not working well? either zero or one, and then the sum of all the entries, sum of all the entries has to be one. What it means is that the, because each entry can only be either zero or one, and then the sum of all these entries or the values in these entries has to be one, there has to be only one entry that has one. And then what we can do is that we can use the index of the, that entry that has value one as the index of the index represented by this ZN, the code vector. So let's look at ZM once more. There are D prime many numbers. So what it means is that the, the one, the value one can appear in the first, second, or all the way to the D prime location. And then there can be only one one. So what it means is that we can use this one at vector to represent any integer between one and D prime. And then this is a way for us to turn the integer representation or the index representation into a vectorized format without assuming any relationship among those entries. What do I mean by that? Because the one at vector that represents, let's say, one, which is going to have one at the very first entry, and then one at vector that represents two, which has one at the second entry, and then one at vector that represents d prime, which has one at the very end of this code vector they're all going to be equally away from each other. If you compute the L2 distance, what's going to be the diff uh, distance is going to be square root of two. And then every pair of the entries or the code vectors that you can imagine 
they are all square root of two distance away. And then that's why we're going to use this one up vector to represent any integer that is between one and d prime inclusive in this case. And then now it actually tells us a lot about what we mean by clustering. So when we think about the clustering, clustering is a very, very traditional problem in machine learning or especially unsupervised learning where the idea is we're given a set of observations. And then what we want is that we want to group them into some finite number of them, some number of clusters. So now we want to build a K-many clusters. And then in each cluster, we're going to assign a small subset of the observations. And then each and every observation can only belong to a single cluster. So if we have K clusters, then each and every observation should belong to one of those K clusters and not any more than one cluster. And that's why it's clustering. And then that naturally tells us about this constraint. What it means is that this Zn, the code vector, tells us about to which cluster the input, the observation, and nth observation belongs. Now, in this case, the name k, k means clustering, is very traditional, or the, you know, it's the historical reason that we call it k. So you can think of this d prime as being k. So we are going to have k many clusters, and then this code vector, this code vector zn, tells us to which cluster out of the k clusters the corresponding nth observation belongs. Now all we need to do is, under this constraint that every, each and every code vector is a one-up vector, we're trying to minimize this Frobenius norm or the squared Frobenius norm of the error, the, the difference between the observation matrix and the reconstruction of the observation using this cluster index and the wave vectors with respect to weight matrix and the code vectors. And then in order to do that, we have learned a lot of different ways to do so. For PCA, because we knew specifically what had to be satisfied, that is the decorrelatedness of the code vectors, we simply derived the whole thing and then ended up learning that the eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix of the input is what, how we are going to solve the PCA. However, on the other hand, in the case of the non-negative matrix factorization, we learned that the, we could use a very same technique that we've been thinking about or that we've been using with the supervised learning. That is, define a cost function, which is this squared for Benius norm, and then trying to compute the gradient with respect, gradient of this loss function with respect to the wing matrix, as well as the code matrix. And of course, there were some constraints that need to be, needed to be met. So what did we do? We did the projective uh, gradient descent. That is, every time we take a small change to both the Wayne matrix as well as code matrix, we projected the solution back into the feasible region, where the feasible region in this case corresponds to a region with non-negative numbers only for both weight and code matrices. Now, in the case of k-means clustering, we're going to consider yet another type of the optimization approach called coordinate descent. So coordinate descent is very, very similar to the usual gradient descent. However, we are thinking more about what is the order in which we change the variables. So that is, in coordinate descent, we can write down the optimization procedure as minimizing some function f. So f is going to be any arbitrary function that we want to minimize. So it can be our cost function in the case of supervised learning and the uh, matrix factorization. But if you're trying to minimize another function, that's fine. It's all pretty high level generic concept. And then we're going to say this input to this function f is going to be separated into two sets, x underscore and then x bar. And then what we want to do is we want to minimize it with respect, to, minimize this f with respect to both x underscore and then x bar. Now this is interesting because it actually does look very, very similar to what we talked about, what we saw earlier. So in the case of matrix factorization, our F, F here is going to be the whole Frobenius norm of the difference between X, the input matrix, and the product of the weight and code matrices. Now 
what are the x bar and the x underscore now x bar in this case is going to be z the code matrix right and then x underscore in this case is going to be w so you see the correspondence here now once you see this correspondence what we notice is that the the entire set of variable that we want to minimize is going to be the in union of the x underscore and the x bar so at the end of the day what we're doing is that we're trying to minimize this f with respect to all the variables out there but the reason why we have divided them is that we are going to solve this minimization pro problem by alternating between minimizing f with respect to x underscore and minimizing f with respect to x bar that is the coordinate descent corresponds to alternate between minimizing f with respect to x underscore and x bar so we're going to minimize the f with respect to the x underscore while keeping x bar as it is and then once i updated it i'm going to keep the x underscore to the original uh, the found value and then minimize the x bar with respect to that now this turned out to be an amazing way to do the minimization as long as there are some mild conditions that are met what are those mild conditions let's think about the conditions the first condition is that the, if once I made some change to the first variable while keeping the second variable, the resulting f, the objective function, should be smaller than equal to the initial value. So this delta underscore corresponds to the update that I'm going to make to the x underscore while keeping x bar. And then this updated version has to be uh, has to have a lower objective value than the original version and then of course as you can see this is pretty much symmetric so we need to have a same kind of guarantee for x bar as well x bar plus delta bar has to be smaller than equal to x underscore and x bar so what it means is that the every time we update one set of coordinates or the variables one of either x bar or x underscore we have to ensure that the, that update is going to get you a slightly smaller objective function value every time if this condi these two conditions are met then all we need to do is we just alternate between these two and then eventually this procedure of coordinate descent is going to converge to a local solution that is where the update is not going to change anymore. And that's just like gradient descent. Now, so we now know about this coordinate descent procedure. So we're going to go back to k-means clustering. So we're going to call it coordinate descent k-means clustering. And then trying to solve this problem of the minimizing the Frobenius norm or the square Frobenius norm with respect to both the wing matrix and the code matrix using coordinate descent. And then what did we talk about? In this coordinate descent, we alternate between minimizing one set of variables while fixing the other set of variables to the existing value, and then doing the uh, vice versa. We're going to fix the first set of variables to the current value, and then update the second set of variables. So let's try to do this. So what would be the first thing we need to do? I'm going to write k-means here. So in the case k-means clustering, the first thing we can do is that we're going to look at updating w the way matrix and then when we say we update w way matrix in coordinate descent procedure that automatically implies that the z is given so our code matrix is given at the moment so z is given and then what we do is that we want to update w now one thing that we need we should keep in our mind is that each column of z z is matrix in this case right so we talked about how z and w and x especially x and z are very very overloaded with the random variable x and z's the observation and code matrices x and z and also the actual observation or the sample from the underlying random variables but in this case each column of z the uh, code matrix is one hot and then what we mean by one hot is that the each column of z 
is going to tell us to which cluster out of k many or the d prime many clusters the corresponding input vector belongs to. So with this in our mind, we're going to write down our loss function as j of w and z. But of course, in this case, what we want to care about is the updating w. So let's focus on that one. Now this is x minus wz, and then squared for minus norm. And then we can rewrite it. We're going to write it as considering each and every observation. So that is the n here, right? So n is going to index each observation we have out of the capital M many of them. Now we consider xn, so we look at the nth observation, and then now we're trying to see what is the corresponding reconstruction using the code vector as well as the weight matrix. And then what we see here is that the wi, we need to first look at the, of course, zn, right? So we need to look at the xn, and thereby we need to look at zn. And then for zn, we're trying to find which of the index, so the cluster index i, is set to 1. So we're trying to figure out to which cluster this x below, to which cluster x belongs to, xn belongs to. What does that mean? Because as we talked about, zn tells us the cluster index of the corresponding observation xn. And this, what well, I have written down using the so-called indicator function, we talked about the indicator function earlier on, but this indicator function returns one if the whatever has been given to this indicator function is true, and then returns zero if not. So what we are doing is that the, okay, here's the nth observation, and then the cluster assignment of nth one. Now, does this input nth observation belong to the ith cluster. So that's what this indicator function computes. And then once I know that is a case, then I'm going to take this, oops, I'm sorry, wi, the corresponding weight vector. So what is the dimensionality of this weight vector? It's going to be rd, right? And then this weight vector is a single row in the weight matrix. And then if you think about it, if I have a weight matrix multiplied with a one up vector, that is a column vector that's identical to simply slicing out one row of this weight matrix, and then which row do we take out that is indicated by the one up vector, the Z, where the one is set to. And then all we do is we try to compute the squared L2 norm here. I'm not going to write down because everything is L, uh, L2 in our case. And then now let's rewrite this by re switching the xi uh, summation over i, so summation over i here, and then summation over n. That is, we're going to look at each and every uh, cluster, and then for each cluster, we're going to look at each and every observation that belongs to that cluster. And then for each and every observation that belongs to a cluster, the our reconstruction corresponds to the row vector of this wing matrix Wi. So here, let's see. So what we have is we have the observation Xn, and then we compare this Xn to the to this Wi. And then that is the weight, the row of the weight matrix or the ith weight vector that is associated with the ith cluster. And then I, we only compare them only if this, only if the nth observation, the corresponding observation belongs to the ith cluster. So this is the same thing as before, just we are talking about the cluster first rather than the observation first. In the first equ in e equation above, what we did was that we look at each observation and then for each observation, we look at to which cluster it belongs 
and then compare that observation against the clusters, uh, the, asso the associated weight vector. Now in the second line, what we do is we look at each cluster and then look into what kind of observations belong to the cluster. And then for those observations, we compare against the associated weight vector. So it's just the same thing written in two different ways, right? Now, what, because we have been able to write down this subjective function in a very particular way, now we can think about computing the gradient or the Jacobian or the gradient in this case with respect to the weight, weight vector wi. So, you know, like this is the same thing as writing down like this. So we're going to simply use the first one because the first equation that is a dj over dwi is much kind of clearer than writing down the gradient symbol and then saying that, oh, this is a gradient of the loss function j plus. Now, in this case, let's see. So we want to compute d over dwi and then it's going to be some no, I'm sorry. Now, in this case, let's look here. Because we are looking at a particular i, we really, what it means is that the, in this summation, we are only looking at the inner part of this summation, a single term, because it's going to be a very specific i. So what it means is that if we want to compute the gradient of the sum over the n, that is the observations, and then we look at only those input observation vectors that belong to this i cluster. And then we look at the L2 distance or square the L2 distance between the observation and the weight vector. And then what we want is we want to make this into zero, but let's continue to continue the derivation a bit. So it's going to be sum over n. And then the very same thing as the indicator function because the indicator function just stays there. Now here, what we now have is that the minus two comes out of the squaredness here. And then I have the xn minus wi. And then I want this to be zero. Now let's try to solve this problem. And then what I end up with is that I can re So one thing you notice is the minus two doesn't really matter because I want to set this whole thing to zero. And then if I multiply the both sides by minus one over two, then still the same, uh, the whole thing holds and then this minus two disappears. That is, I have sum over n indicator function n goes from one and xn minus wi equals zero. And then now what I can do is that because it's just a summation, summations simply separate out to two parts that it involves the xn and then wi. So the first part is going to be sum over n indicator function and then xn minus sum indica oops, indicator function one times wi and then zero. Now the first part, what we see is that it's just summing all the observations that is xn's that belong to the i cluster. So, okay, that's fine. Now the second part, what we see is that the, oops, this wi does not depend on n. It doesn't depend on n. So what it means is that the, I'm going to write down as zin equals one xn minus wi times zin equals one is zero. And then now, what do you see here? So this one is simply counting how many observation vectors, so xn's belong to the i cluster. Right, so this is the count. Let's just write it counting number of observation vectors in the i cluster. So this is just counting, right? So we're going to look at how many of them exist. And then what we end up with is that the wi is going to be the sum of all the observations that belong to the i cluster, that's the term in the numerator, divided by number of such observation in the i cluster. 
So what is that one? That's just the average, right? So we're going to look at all those observation vectors according to this Z that was given belong to the ith cluster. And then what we do is that we're going to simply look at the average or the mean of all these vectors. So this is pretty cool, right? So what we end up with is the, the weight vector i that's going to minimize this objective function j is in fact the average of all the observation vectors that belong to the ith cluster. And then this is solving this problem exactly. So we can solve this problem exactly. And then what it means is that the, unless the weight vector, ith weight vector was already set to be this average of the vectors observations that belong to the ith cluster, this will always make the objective function smaller than the original objective function. What it means is that we know now that the first condition is met with respect to updating this weight matrix. And then what we do is that we are going to do this for every cluster or the every dimension of the code vector. That is, we go from the W1 all the way to WD prime. And then that can be solved quite rapidly, right? It's all pretty parallelizable process. All we do is we need to find the observations that belong to each and every cluster separately. And then there's no overlap, as you remember. And all we do is simply compute the average and then say that that is going to be our weight vector. And then that is one of the reasons why people call this a centroid. So WI is going to be the i centroid. It kind of makes sense why it's called centroid, right? Yes. So now given Z, we know how to set W in order to minimize this objective function J as much as we can. Now it's the second step because we are doing the coordinate up, uh, coordinate descent. We need to update now Z. And then here we have the W, the weight matrix is given. And then how do we know what kind of weight matrix to use? There should be WIs all stacked together. And then there is a question. Uh, WI should still be RD, right? Yes, it should be RD. So why is it RD? This is a very nice question. So let's look at this one at a time. So the number of the observations that belong to the ith cluster, scalar. Now, however, here, the numerator is in fact not a scalar because we have the xn, it's just the average of the xn vectors. So what we end up with is still the dimensional centroid. So we have this centroid. Now what we need to do is we need to update z. w, we know how to compute w, so what it means is that we're going to start from some randomly assigned z, we're going to update w, and then now that we have W, we need to now re-update this C. So how are we going to do that? Let's rewrite this objective function again. J WZ equals X minus WZ. And then that was the squared Frobenius norm. And then again, this is going to be going from N, XN minus WZN, and then square. Now, important thing to notice, again, we're just saying it, I'm just saying it again and again, because it's quite important to notice here is that the, it's all decomposed across N. So what it means is that the, our loss function or the objective function, that is the squared Frobenius norm of the difference between the X and W times Z, that is a product of the code uh, weight and code matrices, this in fact is, can be decomposed across N. So the L2 difference between the XN and the product of the weight matrix and the associated code vector, all we need that can be computed independently of all the other XNs, and all we need to do is simply sum them to end up with this squared Frobenius norm that is the, our original objective function. And then this decomposability turned out to be extremely useful in this specific case of the k-means. Of course, it's useful for everywhere else. However, in this case, it's even more important.
what this means is that because we are now solving for these Zn's, right? So we need to get the Zn's. But what we see is that the Zn appears, each Zn appears in each sum, uh, term in this summation. What it means is that we don't really need to care about all the other terms, all the other observation or the code factors. All we need to care about is just one term inside this. That is, if I wanted to solve this problem, I need to just solve this, mini minimize xn minus wzn squared with respect to this zn. So the index n doesn't really matter. But of course, here there's a big question, right? What is the question? Uh, what is the issue here is that the, it's the constraint. There is a huge constraint on xn, the z vector. That is, zn is 100. So what does it mean that the Zn is one half? What it means is that the Zn or this code vector is not really smooth, it's a discrete variable. This is equivalent, oops, equivalent to saying Zn is discrete. And if you remember, Discrete variables is really, really horrible to work with because we don't know how to compute the derivative with respect to any discrete variables. When we try to compute the derivative or even define a derivative, one thing that we needed was a some notion of the smoothness. We need to be able to tell that the nearby regions, so given any point, nearby neighboring points are going to have some similar values in a similar output. But in the case of the discrete variables, there's not, nothing like that. And in the case of this one-hot vector, which is even more special, in the case of the one-hot vector, there is no notion of the neighborhood. Every other value is the same in the neighborhood because they are all in the same distance away from it. Or the other way to put it is that there is no neighborhood to start with. There is no local neighborhood. So we cannot really compute the gradient of this L2 distance between Xn and W times Zn with respect to Zn. So we cannot really rely on the, uh, the gradient-based optimization as we have learned so far. So instead, it turned out what we can do is that the, we just need to notice that the, the number of clusters that we consider is often small. It's not going to be billions of clusters. One thing for sure is that the we will never want to have the number of clusters to be as large as the number of observations. That just wouldn't make any sense because what we want to know is that the after clustering, all, we, all these observations, right? All these observations should be grouped according to how similar they are. And then there's the notion of grouping. And then if we have as, cluster, uh, as many clusters as there are observations, either each and every cluster is going to get one observation or there will be a lot of clusters that are going to be empty. It just doesn't make any sense. So we are going to have only a small finite number of clusters. What it means is that we can try for, try every possible cluster assignment. That is, there are only D prime or K possibilities here. What do I mean by that is that the xn minus wzn squared has k many probability. That is, first one is going to be xn minus w1, oops, w1 squared, right? That's the first one. If xn belongs to the first cluster, the objective function, that is the reconstruction error, is going to be simply the difference between xn and the first cluster centroid. If Xn belongs to a second cluster, then that's going to be the L2 distance between Xn and W2, that is a second centroid. Of course, if the Xn belongs to a third cluster, we look at the L2 distance between Xn and the third centroid. And then we go ahead all the way until Wd prime. So what it means is that the, this objective function that we want to minimize with respect to the Zn, all we need to do is compute all these 
d prime or k accordingly, because they are essentially the same thing in our case, d prime possible values. And then all we need to do is pick the one that has the smallest or the, uh, the smallest objective function value. That is, if I write it down again, Zn should be, so I'm going to put it, oops, I'm going to put with this arrow because Zn is already used in this case, right? So the new value of Zn should be the one hot representation of the solving, finding, the i, so finding i that's going to minimize this distance, L2 distance between our the centroid, between the corresponding centroid and the observation xn. And then once I find that i, I need to turn that into one other representation that represents i. So what does that tell us is that the, what it means is that this one, this procedure is effectively Finding, finding the nearest cluster. And then the definition of the nearest cluster comes from how close the corresponding centroid, the corresponding cluster centroid is to the input observation. Now, what this says is that the, here, let's see. I'm going to use the color. All we need to do is we just go through each and every observation one at a time, right? So we're going to go through them one at a time. And then for each one of them, we're going to look at each and every cluster again, right? Each and every cluster. And then trying to see whether this, how far this observation is to the centroid of each and every cluster. And then once I get all those distances, I need to, I say that, okay, this observation belongs to cluster that is nearest to this, this observation. And then that is based on the central. And then I can do that for every observation. And then that's the one that's going to minimize this subjective function, right? Because after all, what I did was that the, I used the property of this decomposability. And then for each Xn, I solved this problem of optimization exactly by considering all possible Xn value and then taking the minimal value there. And by adding all those minimal values, I end up minimizing this subjective function. Now, when will be the time this subjective function is going to be not any smaller than the objective function with the original z. That is when already the zn corresponds to the zn already indicates the cluster to which the xn belongs. What it means is that the result, this procedure satisfies the second condition of the coordinate descent. So the procedure by which we decide we decided how decided which cluster each and every observation belongs to corresponds to minimizing this observation given one of the variables that is x underscore, which is in our case, w, the weight matrix, uh, weight vectors. And then what are those weight vectors? That's the cluster, cluster, uh, centroid. So it's a bit confusing, right? So after doing, getting this Zn, what do we do? Is it done? No, so it's a coordinate descent procedure. And then we need to alternate between these two steps. Oops. And then what, what it means is that the, once we got this Cn, then we're going to go back to the first stage of updating W and then update the W again, because as soon as Z changes, the optimal centroids change as well. Why is that? Because the optimal W, optimal W depended upon what kind of observations belong to the corresponding cluster? And then this Z tells us about which cluster each observation belongs to. So once we change this centroids again, we need to go back to this Z update procedure. And then here, we notice that the, this Zn is very likely to change because the choice of Zn depends on all these 
cluster centroids, W1, W2, all the way to WB prime. And then that's going to change Zn. And then once Zn changes, then W needs to change. But by alternating between these two, eventually this whole procedure of the coordinate descent is going to get stuck at a solution where both Z w, uh, w, uh, Wi's and Zn's do not change. So they're going to converge to a solution giving you a particular clustering assignment. So there's a question from Adam. So we first randomly assign cluster to each observation. Yes, that's correct. So what we do is initially when we are given data points, that is the X observation matrix, we're going to randomly assign each and every data points into a, any cluster, any one of the D prime clusters. And then once the clustering is done, we can finally, we can first obtain the cluster centroids, that is update the Wayne matrix. And then once the Wayne matrix is updated, we need to update the cluster assignment. Once the cluster assignment is updated, we need to update the cluster centroids. And then because the cluster, cluster centroids have been updated, we need to update the cluster assignment and go back and forth until the whole procedure converges. And as, uh, as John asked, yes, it is definitely possible that you're stuck at local minimum. So one thing you notice is that the, this whole problem of matrix factorization clearly has many, many different uh, solutions, even with all these constraints. Why is that so? Because you can always shuffle the dimensions. You can permute the dimensions, and then the solutions stay the same. Let, let's talk. Let's talk about that briefly because that's a bit of an important uh, important property that you should know. So we have x, which is going to be, oops, which is going to be x1, x2, xn, and then w is going to be w1, w2, wd prime transpose. Okay, and then we have a z, which is going to be z1, z2, and then zn. Now I'm going to introduce a operator called permutation, or I'm going to call it perm. And then this perm is going to simply permute the indices. So that is, perm of the z is going to be, let's say, so z here is going to be vector, right? So it's going to be d prime dimensional vector. Oh, let's just write it as in the equation, yes. It's going to be d prime dimensional vector. And then what I'm going to do is z3, z1, z2, and then all the others are same. I can make it like this. And then what I can do is I can simply apply this permutation operator to w and then permutation operator to z. And then this is same as z time w times z. What it means is that the, there are at least as many solutions that are equivalent in terms of the objective function that is the reconstruction error and then those solutions can be simply obtained by permuting the dimensions in the code vector so yes the whole problem of matrix factorization is not complex there are many different solutions but what the coordinate descent procedure that we have designed for the k-means clustering relies on the fact that the one when either w or z is fixed minimizing this uh, this objective function with respect to the other is convex so we can solve it exactly and then there is only a single solution however overall it's going to find a solution out of all these many different solutions and there is a follow-up question that is what is uh yukon asked what is the intuition of why this process would work can we see a concrete example now the of course intuition is very important but what you need to see first is that the mathematical reason why it should work. We start with this matrix factorization, which hopefully is very clear to you why it is a useful tool for us to work with in the case of the clustering or this kind of unsupervised learning. And then what happens is that we know that the coded descent procedure minimizes any objective function with respect to a multiple non-overlapping subsets of the coordinates or the variables as long as a certain conditions are met. And then in the case of k-means algorithm, we have noticed that we can separate the variables 
that is the WNZ into WNZ, uh, the, the concatenation of WZ into the separate things. And then we try to minimize the objective function with respect to each one of them. And then we know that the, those important conditions are met because we can actually minimize them perfectly every time using the idea of the convexity and the decomposability of the loss function. So in fact, if you think about it more from the mathematical point of view, the k-means algorithm is not really that different from any kind of matrix factorization algorithms that we talked about last week, such as the principal complement analysis, as well as non-negative matrix factorization. So that is the reason why it works. Now, intuitively, what it does. Now, let's try to draw some mental picture about it. Now, you're going to think about 3D or even ND space. You're going to just imagine it. And then there are a number of data points that are out there. And then what you're going to do is that the initially, you're going to start with any kind of random cluster assignment. You don't know what's the right way to cluster them. However, what you want is that the, every time you look at the cluster, let's say data, you want to update how well the data is clustered. And then how you're going to do that is to try to figure out what is the good centroid of the cluster. And then once the centroid of the cluster is changed, then what kind of examples are good for each of the clusters change as well. So you need to just go on and on, back and forth between those two. So let's see. Um, so there is a follow-up question by Yu Kong. It's just that updating Z when we already have a W with respect to the original Z is weird. Okay, this is a very interesting thing, right? So now let's think about it in this. Let's, let's think about the coordinate descent first, okay, instead of the clustering, because the clustering, you're going to see how clustering works intuitively using all those as a visualization on Wednesday at the lab session. So what I want to do is that the, I want to solve a problem where the objective function looks like this. And it's going to be two dimensional space. I'm going to call the first dimension, oops, x1 and then x2, or the x, x, use the x bar and then x underscore. And then this is our loss function. So I'm going to say f of x underscore and x bar. So this is the objective function that we want to minimize. And then of course the, the actual minima, there are multiple minima, and then in this case we have two minima. Okay. And then how we're going to solve this problem is we're going to start from some random place. We're going to start from this random place. Now we're going to first look at the slice along the x, x bar. And then in this slice, how we notice is that the dysfunction looks like this. Oops, I'm sorry. This function looks like this, right? In this slice that is along this second variable. And then based on this second variable, where we should end up now is here. So that's where we're going to move. And then once we move along that direction, we're going to look at now the X underscore. And then along this X on, let's not use the red one because I used the minimum for the red one. Let's use the blue one in this case. We're going to now slice along this dimension. And then what we now see is that the, this function is going to look like, let me see. Uh, what would be the nice route? Look like this. And then because of this, we're going to move here. And then now here, what, we, what are we going to do? We're going to do the very same thing, but now, hold on along the first x bar dimension, right? So the x bar dimension, now we look here. And then here as well, what we see is that there's a very already very low, but we can go further low and then it comes up. So we're going to move to here. So let's zoom in a bit, move here. And then now we change this again to looking into the x underscore. So we're going to cut it down here. And then at this point, we know where the minimum is already. So this is the intuition behind what the coordinate descent procedure does. That is, we're going to look at one coordinate or the one set of 
subset of coordinates at a time. And then we try to minimize this objective function for each coordinate or the, each subset of coordinate at a time. And then as we go back and forth, as long as we can guarantee that every time we are going to meet, lower the value of the objective function, then eventually it's going to converge to a fixed point that has a zero gradient for us. And, the, and this, the nice thing about coordinate descent is that the, we can always divide the coordinates in a way that allows us to solve a problem if it's effect, uh, effectively. So what do I mean by, by effectively? In the case of k-means clustering, if we did not, if we had not divided the coordinates into the weight vectors and the code vectors, and then if we decided to somehow cut it into a different way so that the one subset of the coordinates contains both the weight vectors as well as some small parts of the code vectors, we cannot compute the gradient of the objective function with respect to all these input, uh, this subset of the coordinates because they are discrete parts and we won't be able to solve it. But because we are able to split the coordinates in a cleverly that allows us to use the gradient based uh, optimization for the weight vector part while using this simple and very straightforward exhaustive approach to solving the optimization problem for the code vector side, we can use this coordinate descent procedure to solve this problem exactly. Now, let's see, I think there was another question there. So there is a question from Carol that I missed. Uh, will the cost function definitely converge because it's L2 norm? Now, it's not because it's L2 norm. The cost function is going to converge because we're using a coordinate descent procedure. And then in the case of the k-means, updating w and updating the code matrix, uh, code vectors z, in fact, satisfy these two conditions. That is, every time we update w, we ensure that this objective function f or j in our case is going to be smaller than equal to the original value. And then when we update z, the code vectors, the same thing happens. And then we always decrease it little by little. And then eventually at the point where neither of them can update, uh, you know, can uh, neither of them, neither, as, neither of the w nor z changes, that's when it converges. So does it have to be L2 norm? No, that's not necessarily true. For instance, if we decided to change this L2 norm with the L1 norm, then things change a bit. That is, the first updating the W part doesn't change that much, except that we are not going to end up with the average of the Xn, but we're going to end up with computing the median, median of Xn. And then, what we start calling it is called k-medioid. And then that's going to be often a bit more robust to outliers because the further away points, the distance to further away points does not grow as fast as the L2 distance if you use L1 distance because we don't square them. However, in general, L1, even with the L1 norm, we can show that there is k-means or the k-medioid with the coordinate descent converges to solution. So generally, k-means algorithm converges very, very nicely as long as you know how to compute update w and you know how to update c, which is not always the case. You have to be aware of that. So this is the k-means clustering algorithm, which looks slightly different from the PCA or the non-negative matrix factorization, but how we derive the whole thing looks like they are, this is exactly the same as PCA and non-negative matrix factorization. Now, looking at this k-means algorithm, you start actually noticing something very, very, uh, you start, let's say, becoming a bit of, uh, you, you, you start having some kind of, let's say, deja vu moment, right? What is this deja vu moment that you're having? Is that the, because of this use of the one effect. And then where do we actually, talk about the one out vector before was in the multi-class classification. And then let's come down to this updating Z part. How we updated Z was to compute the distance between the observation and some change of the Z. 
And in this, because Z is just one of vector, there was just looking at the difference between observation and one of the associated vector. Now, if you remember from the multi class classification, how do we actually decide which observation, uh, which class the observation belongs? Let's remember that by writing down a bit. So in multi-class classification, oops, that's not even a multi. Multi-class classification, we learned about the softmax classifier. And then in softmax classifier, we said that the probability of y being c, the cth class, so that is given x, what is the cth class, was given as softmax, right? We use the softmax of the WC transpose X plus BC. And then we're going to go over all the classes, right? So here, actually, let's try to use C K here. Right? X sub of WC prime transpose X plus BC prime. And then now let's just assume that the, that the BC is zero for all C. So we're going to say that, okay, there's no bias associated with any of these classes. And in which case, this becomes X of WC transpose X plus, oops, we remove the BC, right? Over some C prime one to K, X of WC prime transpose X plus BC prime. Oh, not BC prime. So this would be the class probability of the Cth class given the observation. And then once the training is over, how will we actually select which class to which the observation belongs? We're going to simply say that the argmax of log P of Y equals C given X, right? So this is going to be the solution. Now, looking at this solution, the interesting thing happens is that the, what we are looking at is effectively the dot product between WC transpose and X. So what we are seeing is that the, we are looking for a class where the associated weight vector WC is close to the observation X in the where the distance metric or the distance that we have used is the dot product. On the other hand, in the case of k-means, what we do is we choose the cluster to which observation xn belongs to by looking at the distance between the observation and each cluster centroid or the weight vector wi. And here the distance is computed using the Euclidean distance. Now let's try to rewrite this Euclidean distance. It's going to be xn squared plus w1 squared minus 2xn transpose w1. Now and then you do see this dot product term there. So what we are looking for is how well the observation and centroid aligns with each other. And then based on that, we assign the observation to the best aligning cluster or class, depending on whether you're doing the multi-class classification or you're doing the k-means clusters. Of course, we do have this square term of the weight vectors, which didn't really appear in the case of the multi-class classification when we're trying to use it in the test time. However, if you remember from the Sapovec machines, minimizing the L2 norm of the weight vector or weight vectors corresponded to maximizing the margin. And so we did actually have this term already in the learning phase in the multi-class classification. On the other end, in the k-means clustering, this L2 norm comes out in this assignment process. So what this means is that the PCA, non-negative matrix factorization, k-means clustering, all these unsupervised learning algorithms, in fact, have in inside a supervised learning. In the case of PCA, 
we talked about how PCA looks very, very similar to the linear regression. In particular, the linear regression that we talked about in the Bayesian linear regression. And then what it means is that in the case of the PCA, we are trying to solve the linear regression problem using only the input. However, by trying to put some kind of constraint on the target, that is Z. In the case of k-means clustering, we are trying to solve, in fact, the multi-class classification problem, except that we are not given the associated target. Only thing that we know is we are using the L2 norm or the Frobenius norm in the case of the matrix notation. And then the fact that the input belongs to only one of the classes or the clusters. So in this coordinate descent procedure, we do see that the solving the multi-class classification when the target or the classes are given here, and then when the problem or the multi-class classifier is given, we're trying to assign each observation into the class using this multi-class classifier. We update them over and over. So what it means is that the most of these unsupervised learning algorithms that we're going to talk about, we have talked about, and we are talking about today, they all have the supervised learning algorithm within it in order to solve these problems. And then that's why we spent more than half of this whole semester on trying to learn about supervised learning and how we put the supervised learning by defining a cost function and then trying to minimize it with respect to the observations we do. So that actually concludes today's lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, you know what to do. You go to the campus wire, unload, uh, the post your question there so that I can answer it and then all your peers can also see both the question and the answers. I'm going to unload both the lecture note as well as the recording probably tonight. All right, then class dismissed. Bye-bye.